Great, we should be set to go live then. Which means that now we can talk about who we are. John, would you like to go first? Well, hi, so I'm, I'm John Reed. I've been stargazing seriously for about 10 years now. And I was, I was a late bloomer to astronomy. So I didn't see anything cool until I was an adult because I had binoculars and, and, and telescope as a, as a kid and my dad had them. Um, but I never figured out how to focus it. You know, had I done that, I probably would have got an astrophysics degree a lot earlier than at right off 30, 37. <laughs> um, yeah, so 10 years ago, I discovered astronomy, uh, got a small telescope at the local pharmacy, saw Saturn, was blown away, started, uh, joined an astronomy club, started volunteering uh, four nights a week because this was California and we had no clouds and it was great. Uh -huh. And uh, after about maybe well over 100 um, outreach sessions, I decided to put everything I had learned into a book called 50 Things to, to See with a Small Telescope. And that was the number one stargazing book on Amazon for several years. Uh, and, it, and it did quite well. And so then I, I left, I was in corporate finance before, I quit my job, moved to Canada, got into an astrophysics degree, spent four years doing that, which actually took away from being an amateur astronomer because you're not actually going out and learning constellations and stuff. You're doing computer programming and learning calculus uh, and yeah, doing all sorts of weird math you never knew existed. And then, so now I just finished the astrophysics degree four years later. And, <laughs> uh, it is time for me to learn amateur astronomy again and sort of take my amateur game up to the next level. And so that brings us up to today. Jenna. Bearing, in, bearing in mind that he has like multiple telescopes in the background. So like you're at a pretty good amateur astronomy level already, John. <laughs> Only one of these is real. Oh, is the other one? The other, oh, right. The other ones are in the photo. The oh, that's very yeah. sneaky. Yeah, that's just the photo. <laughs> Um, so welcome everybody. I'm Jenna. You may have seen me before on this channel. I'm the uh, Youth Outreach Outreach Coordinator for the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada. Um, this program, so I'm not going to talk too much about my background because I too, like John, showed up in astronomy in, quite late in the game. I studied marine biology first, so uh, I joined into the astronomy world about three years ago or so um, and started working here about a year and a half ago. And I only just started observing to prepare for this course. So you're learning it only weeks after I've learned it, <laughs> um, which is a, which is not a bad way to learn it because uh, hopefully I will have made most of the mistakes for you um, and John can help us with some of this stuff too. So this program is we have is a is an online version of one of our observing programs. We have multiple observing programs at the RISC where you can go out and see stuff and write down that you've seen stuff and then get pins and certifications for having seen it. It's kind of a fun thing to do just in general because I mean, who doesn't like getting pins um, and you get to collect the pins. Uh, this is a particularly fun one because anyone can do it. You don't have to be a member of the RESC. The rest of our observing programs you do. So it's a good one to start with. And it's just a, a like, it's a nice thing to have on your resume if you're, if you're younger and you're looking to show your interest in your hobbies that you can have, show that you've achieved something that you can set long-term goals. Uh, all that, all sorts of stuff like that. So it's it's a really fun program. I'm really excited to do it with you guys. Uh, and I'm so glad that you're all here to see it. This is the first time that we've done anything like this though. So if you have any feedback, please just let us know if we can help you out in any way. If there's something that you need that we haven't provided. Um, if you need a better explanation of something, anything like that, let us know as we go. Um, if you're joining us on YouTube, you can also uh, join on the Zoom webinars in advance if you'd like to. So those are, you can uh, go to a link that I will post in the YouTube chat in a minute, which is rask.ca slash etu online to be able to register and get all the information. And that spot too, which I will send out in the chat here, um, is the spot where we're going to be posting everything about this program. So we've got extra links there. We've got um, a calendar that you can use on Google Calendar to like ping you when you want to go out observing and when there's targets to be seen. Um, so that's all set up on that page. Registration links, all that will be there. Okay, um, I think that covers the all of the housekeeping -y stuff. Now, yeah. before, so what, what we're going to do with these sessions is we're going to have a chunk of time at the beginning where we're going to go over um, what's coming up in the next two weeks and what our list of targets is for those two weeks. And then we're gonna have a big sharing session where you guys can let us know how your observations went. Um, we're gonna tell you how ours went because I don't know about you, John, but I'm gonna be going out uh, and taking a look at the sky. Um, and, yeah, sure. and we'll address your comments, your questions, your concerns. If you had issues, if you had dew on your telescope, how do you get rid of it? 
if you had too many bugs and you forgot the bug spray, all that sort of stuff. So um, that's what we're gonna do towards the end. And at first we're gonna go over um, the targets that we're gonna see that week. But today, since it's the first one, we're gonna go over some helpful tools. Um, I'm gonna start with the book named after this program or the program named after this book or however, whichever way you wanna go by that. Um, this book uh, now comes with RASC membership. It's a relatively new edition. Um, we started sending these out with RASC membership in November. So if you've been a member for a while and you don't have this book, um, just let us know and we can send it out to you. Uh, it goes through some basics like how to, uh, the different phases of the moon. There you go, how to observe, gives you a little tips and tricks that we're gonna also go over in this program too. So you don't need this book, but it's relatively helpful for some things. Um, the other option, if you're feeling adventurous, is the pretend this is 2020. Um, the Observer's Handbook, my 2020 version is in my car. Um, and this has everything that you could possibly wanna know about space. It's a little overwhelming, which is why I'm kind of hesitant to recommend it. But if you have it, there's some good useful stuff in here. The number one thing that I use, there's a section um, that tells you exactly what's happening that month with all of the interesting things that are happening, all the moon phases and where all the moons of Jupiter are gonna be, which is kind of cool. Um, so that goes through that throughout the year. And the main thing that I used while I was planning this course was the moon map, which I know is not John's favorite, which I understand. <laughs> um, but I, I, it gets the job done. It has a more like visual version of the moon and then it has everything labeled and you can find the craters and then Mari and all that sort of stuff that we'll get into. And yeah. then there's John's book. I'm a, well, I'm a big fan of this moon map, which I think is, I think I paid about eight bucks for it. Where is that? That's nice. Yeah, it's a sky and telescope one, although it might be out of print. So there's like used ones um, coming up on Amazon once in a while. And you also want to get one that matches your optics. So if you're using a refractor telescope with a 90 degree diagonal, I have one on the table here, with all my, all my toys, um, but it'll be a mirror reverse image. So you want to use the map that matches your optics. Right. Okay. So yep. we're going to start on the basics with that. <laughs> slow down we'll slow down because john john knows a lot and john has a ton of experience um but there's a lot of steps involved in this stuff so going over um a couple of things that we have on offer before we get to how telescopes and binoculars work um we have some log books for this stuff if you're interested john's log book is the only one that you can purchase right now it's really cool john will you please show us your new book yeah, sure. So I, I created a companion guide to my two books, 50 Things to See with a Telescope and 50 Things to See on the Moon, and created an activity workbook so that you can go through and log um, your progress as you go through those targets in both of those books. So this book can be used independently. So let's say you only bought this book and you have some stargazing software that has the maps and you know you have a lunar map, you can, you can use it in that regard as well. The other thing cool about this book is we included everything we couldn't fit into the other books. So I put in instructions on how to use every possible combination of telescope and mount. <laughs> um, we go into actually detailed instructions on how to set up your telescope, collimate your mirrors if they get out of alignment. And so you've got all these neat tools uh, in this book as well. And then it starts with constellations. So I have you draw them with a pencil first and then go out and observe them. And so that's that's one thing that's connected to explore the universe. Then when we get to deep sky objects, you have the list of targets and a place to draw them, which comes in really handy. And then when you get to the moon, um, we've got a page for almost every phase of the moon. So what you do is you look at the moon and you draw what you see that night, and then you can go and label it just looking at the opposite page. So for example, this is what you would do on the full moon. And then if you look up in the sky and it's a crescent moon, you know, you would draw what you see here and then you can look at the other page and just label the craters as you see them. And so that's, that's the idea here. I love that because I suck at drawing and it's so, it's so nice to have <laughs> the other page to look back and see like, okay, does this look anything like what it's supposed to look like? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and then I added some challenges for the planets too, like drawing the position of Jupiter's moon. So that would be a challenge. Um, and then just seeing some of the planets like Mercury, uh, for example, just seeing that at all, because it, it, it's low on the horizon. 
Um, and it's only, there's only a, a few days a year where it's really great to see. Yeah. So that's awesome. I just sent out yeah. the link in the chat if you wanna buy it. Um, I can't send it out in the YouTube chat, unfortunately, because it is uh, too long. <laughs> um, let me see yeah, if I can try A quick search it. on, on Amazon, amazon.ca or, or amazon.com, either one. There's um, a few things to see with the telescope. It ships in just a couple days. And then that is the companion to 50 things to see on the moon and 50 things to see with the telescope. So, uh, All good resources uh, if you're looking for nice pictorial follow alongs. It's very helpful. Yeah. Um, a lot of times with beginning, when you're going out to observe for the first couple of times, it's hard to figure out what you should be seeing. Um, and that's one of the great things that I really like about your books, John, is that you have those pictures there that are like, this is a fuzzy object and this looks vaguely like this fuzzy object. Like it's not the, those bright, beautiful Hubble images yeah. uh, that you normally get, which is yeah, good. For every, for every object in all the books, um, it shows what it looks like through a telescope. And it shows in the case of the moon book, because you might have a reversal or a 180 foot, um, you're going to get all three of those images. So like, this is what it would look like in binoculars. And then of course, this is zoomed in, you know, here's what it would look like in a reflector telescope. And here's what it would look like in a refractor telescope. So we made sure for the beginner, we covered exactly what it's going to look like uh, in your telescope. Which is awesome. It's and so, so I think this is one of the only books that actually does that. So. Um, well, aren't you fabulous, John? Which is, which is huge. <laughs> I thank you. Now you are. You're pretty great. Thank you, Jenna. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing that the other thing that we have for folks who are members of the RESC uh, or anyone who is like desperate to get their logbook um, checked or really likes spreadsheets, which I do fall into that category in all fairness, um, we are getting these printed. We haven't got them printed yet. This was a test run, um, but these will be available on our website soon. They are literally just the PDFs that are available online, also on the same website that I sent the link to earlier. So the list of what's required for this program is on there is in here. Then there's logbook pages. If you want, you can see my my very, very strongly mediocre drawings of M13. Look at that. It is a fuzzy blob, but I'm pretty proud of it. Um, and then it has a, a spreadsheet at the back that has um, where you've logged all your stuff and extra notes and stuff like that. So that's available for anybody who wants to um, to like use more spreadsheets and less um, pictures. Uh, and then you can also download that online. Yes. Uh, and at the back of the workbook as well, there's a spot where you can just tally up how many of each object you've seen. And so here's a list of the five different types of objects. And that would that makes sure that you've met the requirements for Explore the Universe. So that's just at the back page of the workbook. We added in there. I added that there. Awesome. So there's there's basically different options for everybody and, and different options for whatever gets you going. When it comes to actually logging your observations, you don't technically have to draw them you also don't technically uh, have to write them down you could record them on your phone uh, with your voice if you wanted to if that's easier for you um, there's lots of options for observing that aren't so you can you can choose what suits suits you best um, but using John's book and using this spreadsheet to kind of give you an idea of what you want to take note of like is not a bad idea but you can also just record it on your phone and someone asked in the chat um, about the because the books, the books don't feature, at least mine don't feature the coordinates of the objects. And the reason I didn't do that is because they're, they're really, the, the, they're, it only covers the, the beginner objects. So, you know, no, nothing in, the, in either of the books um, is complex enough to need uh, lat and long on the moon or, you know, RA and deck in the sky. So it's, we're not getting into that level of complexity in this. Um, at least I, I don't think no, so, are we? We're not, we're talk, no, we're not, we're no. Talk, uh, right ascension declination? No, 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 we're not getting no. into anything too complicated. This is an intro course, everybody. Okay. So I know there's a sure. lot of you who have um, lots of experience, 100% awesome. Uh, and you can help out the other folks who are here as well. Um, but you, and, and yeah, thank you for the folks who are contributing as well. Some people say they like to image and you can absolutely put those images into a big long PDF and just write down which would, what each target is and when you saw it, all that sort of stuff if you want to. Um, Linda, you prefer to, to write a description, 100% okay. Play to your strengths. I am not an artist at all. That's why I went into sciences. Um, but I'm, I'm quite enjoying having the opportunity to like try. There's my not very good moon drawings, for example. And um, those are different craters. I like trying, but I don't know if I'm, you know, who knows if I'm gonna stick with it. It's nice to try it. It's my first time observing. Just do, do whatever makes you feel good. And, uh, and if sketching is not your thing, don't sketch, write down instead. Yep. Um, 
the yeah getting into the right ascension and declination so this is this is what the pages for this program look like and i can actually share these with you if you want to on the screen but they've got a ton of information around them we're here to help you find the targets without having to sort through all that information that's things like thank you simon for your support he says that my moon drawings are awesome i appreciate it mine don't yeah, have that much value they're pretty good they're way better than mine <laughs> i i've hosted a lunar sketching course before so i should have to, i have i've tried a little bit but i'm not i'm not qualified for that um so yeah basically there's a few notes about about each target in this pdf the pdf's on our website same website that i sent out rasp.ca slash etu online um it has lots of information the most useful things i found are the stuff that you can put into stellarium and the magnitudes because the magnitudes are will help you figure out what you can see from where you are yeah. Um, so my one explain what Stellarium is. So that's just our yes. favorite piece of uh, stargazing software that's free to download. Um, for the, I use it on the computer uh, for the most part, but it is on. You can get an app for your phone or iPad, or you can use it just on a web page as well if you don't like downloading stuff. So that brings us to the tools that we will be using for this course. So I'm gonna we're gonna be using Stellarium almost exclusively to help you um, find this stuff and show you where it is and show you what the sky looks like. Um, so I'm gonna get Stellarium up and running so that you can. Um, that you can see what it looks like. Also from Dave, will you be hosting another looter sketching class in the future? Quite possibly. We were gonna try to do one online, um, but we just never we never got around to it. The one that we hosted was in um, at the ROM back on the Lunar New Year, back when we could see people. That oh, was a lovely time. So um, we will try to do lunar sketching online. We're seeing a little bit of support for it, so we'll do our best. Okay, I think that more or less covers everything that I wanted to cover. Um, oh, it does not. I wanna cover a couple other things before we show you what the targets are tonight. We're gonna to be getting into this slowly over the next couple of weeks. And so I'm not gonna, I know folks are itching to probably talk about um, like light pollution and, and that sort of stuff that would be would apply. We're gonna talk about that next week because this week the moon's full anyway. So we're gonna not worry about that yet. For now, what I wanna talk about is how to find your way around the night sky in the first place. Um, this is something that seems counterintuitive to me a lot of the time. When you're looking at a map, you see, and you can picture this wherever you are, you see north, east, south, and west in a clockwise circle. But when you're actually on Earth, we typically tend to look south when we're observing because there's just more stuff there. Um, and so because of that, because you're facing south and you're looking up at the sky instead of looking down at a, um, at a compass, the sun sets in the west, which is gonna be on your right-hand side and it rises in the east, which is gonna be on your left. So you might have to think about it every time that you go out. And when we say like, it's on the eastern side of the constellation, we mean on the side closest to where the sun's rising or on the western side of the constellation, it's on the side closest to where the sun's setting. I'll show you guys that in Stellarium. And I'll also talk about the directions on the moon because we'll be using those a little bit as well. Um, just before we get too far, I noticed that this question has been asked twice. For, what ki for kids, what telescope should we buy? The what telescope should I buy question is gigantic. <laughs> you never expect it to be. And I mean, John, I have my own advice, but what would your advice be? Yeah, mine, mine actually changes all. It's also budget specific too, right? So I I mean, RASC in general recommends people start with binoculars and by going to the club uh, mm -hmm. and, using, and using telescopes. If you're gonna go out and buy one and you've got a lot of room, uh, a, a Dobsonian is usually the place to start. So that's one of those big uh, long light buckets. Usually they sit on the ground, those tabletop versions as well. Um, if you're a little constrained for space, uh, you know, you want something you can easily throw in the car and carry, usually something like uh, this, which is on a mount uh, that's, it's called alt as, so it goes up, down, left, right. Not something that's mounted equatorially like this. If it's got goofy angles and stuff, then um, that's, you know, a more and more advanced, uh, more advanced telescope, um, you know, but let's say you've got a, a $200 budget and you really want a telescope, um, I, can, I can post a link to, you know, a basic Celestron that meets, meets those criteria. And that okay. you could use for this if you don't want to do it with binoculars and you, and, and you really want a telescope. Sounds good, thank you, John. I'm gonna, while I get into Stellarium, maybe you can find that link, the link to that telescope, is that okay? Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, okay. and again, you, a good way to, um, to pick up a telescope is to get a used one, but you want to know which telescope you want before you look for the telescope. 
Mm -hmm. um, you don't want to just see find a telescope on Kijiji or Craigslist and then buy it because it's there and it's cheap. Like you want to. Yeah, you want to put some thought into it. Yeah. So there's an and in terms of choosing a telescope, it really depends on what you're interested in seeing primarily and where you are and how much you want to spend and how much you want to carry. Like there's a lot that goes into choosing a telescope. Um, and yeah, age and height of children is important. So like younger kids work better with binoculars because it's more logical to them to hold something up to your face and look where you're going. Um, uh, so, so really, yeah, it's, it, it's quite complex. Um, there's a couple articles in Sky News about it. Um, I can look for those as well, but John's, John's option is a good one. And um, yeah, just, just try out, I, in my opinion, my, my advice is almost, and I know John's advice is conflicting with this, but that's okay. My advice is almost always try binoculars first, but I know not everyone's into that. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, the reason they want a telescope in the first place is to see the rings of Saturn and to really dive into those lunar craters. So like those two things. And that can be a challenge with binoculars. And it's, it's a harder, it can be harder to get that oh wow moment if you're in the city um, using binoculars. Whereas if you're in, in the country and you're using binoculars, like you look up, there's gonna be so many stars, it'll mm -hmm. blow your mind. But you're not gonna get that sensation in, in the city if you, never, if you never leave and go outside of town. That's true. And, and the nice thing about observing in the city is that you can use, um, you, can, you, you can look at the planets, you can look at the moon and the moon is absolutely gorgeous. So uh, that part is definitely true, uh, John. I like binoculars, but that's because I do have access to darker skies from time to time. Okay, I'm gonna show you guys Stellarium. This is Stellarium. We have an entire past video dedicated to how to use Stellarium. So you can dive into that if you want to. It's on our YouTube channel. Um, this is a free open source program that can be used on any platform and it's essentially planetarium software. So it gives you a view of whatever sky you would like at whatever time you would like. Right now, we're in Toronto because that is where I am. Sorry, everybody. Um, I apologize for my city. Um, and we've got uh, the date and time here. Um, you can move it to whenever you'd like. If you want to see what it looked like on your birthday, whatever, that's all great. We're going to use it to look at what's going on tonight um, and a couple of features on the moon as well. So I'm going to scoot us ahead in time. So we've got, this is just after sunset. We've got the moon up tonight. There it is. Whoop. And the reason I'm bringing up the moon is because our first targets that we're going to be looking at are on the moon. The moon is like the easiest place to start because everyone can see it provided the weather's good. You don't need to be in a really dark sky. You don't need to be in, uh, you know, you can be in the middle of the city as long as you have a view in the right direction at the right time. Everyone can take a look at it. So tonight it's going to be a crescent. But this week's targets, and we have these up on our Google Calendar, but I'll, I'll put them up in... I have to find a better way to put out the targets themselves. We'll figure that out. Let me know what you guys think I should do. Um, the targets this week are all going to be on the full moon. You can see some of them beforehand and some of them a little bit after, but most of them are going to be on the full moon. And that's going to be July 5th. So we're going to jump to July 5th, except we are now, there we go. There's July 5th. So here's the full moon. You'll be able to see a little bit before and a little bit after as well. So if you've got clouds on July 5th, don't worry about it. This is what the moon's going to look like through binoculars, so or just with your naked eye. It's just going to look like this. Um, the first, so first of all, John, do you have any tips for observing the full moon? What are your tips for observing the full moon? Um. Uh, oh gosh, I mean, I could I could go on. So the moon illusion, I like I like experiencing the moon illusion first. So when the when the full moon first comes up, it looks huge. And it's always neat to check that it's it's the same size as it is when it's high up in the sky. Like it doesn't suddenly grow just because mm -hmm. it's near the horizon. And that's, that's just an optical illusion. The way that I always check is I have to hide the moon with my pinky finger. That's the first thing I do when I'm observing the full moon every time. I make sure that the universe still makes sense and it's I can hide it behind my pinky finger um, because the moon is only about a half a degree of sky wide. Um, it's way smaller than you think. Yeah, and also take note of the color because it's going to reflect whatever's in the atmosphere at the time. So, you know, right now we've got a sandstorm that's blowing some dust up the coast, east coast of North America. So it'd be interesting to see, like, if that sandstorm is still there, what color is the moon going to be? Mm -hmm. um, through binoculars or a telescope, the moon is very, very bright. 
And especially through a telescope, because you're taking all those photons from this giant mirror lens and, and putting them in your eye. And so there's a couple things that you can do. One, a lot of telescopes come with one of these and it'll literally say moon filter on the side. So this one says moon filter. Some of them will say polarizing or something like that. And so you, this is sort of like sunglasses for your telescope and that helps increase the contrast um, when you're looking at the full moon because, because it's so bright, you're gonna lose a lot of the detail in these craters and stuff. So, um, so, that's, uh, so that's one way you can, you can help increase the clarity of, of the full moon. Uh, so that's a few tips for me. I know there's, there's plenty more. Sounds good. The other option too, and this was from my lovely friend who's on the call right now, Linda, um, she recommended, where do they go? Wearing sunglasses if you're looking through at the full moon through binoculars, because it can be so bright. Yeah. Um, which is like essentially a, a life hack neutral density slash moon filter. It's good enough. Does the job. Yep. The, other, <laughs> the other thing you can do is some telescopes, I just happen to have a telescope here. Like, so much of course you do. <laughs> some telescopes have um, a cover with a hole in it. And the reason um, that the, the cover has a hole in it, and it's kicking around here somewhere, um, is that you can take off that little cap and then you still get a full image of the moon, even though you're covering up most of um, the telescope. And that's because any light that hits that back mirror is gonna hit a full image in your eye. But what it does is it, it, it brings down the brightness of, that, of the moon. And that's what that's for, so. Perfect. I'm trying to meanwhile find the, um... Okay, so a couple questions. I'll get to the questions in a second because um, I can't have them up at the same time as Solarium, unfortunately. Um, one person did mention is in July 5th also the penumbral eclipse. And it is, good memory. I'm not a huge fan of penumbral eclipses because they basically are just a very slight darkening of the moon. Um, and I find that when they're spoken about, people get disappointed because they're expecting like a full lunar eclipse, except it's basically just a tiny bit of a shadow on the moon. So. There will be an eclipse on the weekend or on July 5th, sorry, but it's just like a little, a little darkening. So don't get your hopes too high up, um, but you might be able to see it. Okay, so this week's targets on the moon um, are all full moon targets. So the things that you can see on the full moon, you should be able to see them a little bit before and after too. Um, and the first one is one of the easiest to spot mares. So the mares, these dark areas on the moon are areas where, um, a, it's a, a different type of rock. So essentially la, uh, there were crater impacts on, and the lava on the moon welled up into the what was left in the crater impacts and created these darker spots. So that's when you see the man on the moon or the bunny on the moon. Um, Chris Vaughn from the Insider's Guide to the Galaxy series told me about Wilma on the moon. So like Wilma of Flintstone with her like her big hair here and her eye and her oh, nose yeah. and mouth and like her bun. So now I can't see anything but Wilma. Um, so if I ever talk about Wilma, that's why it's because Chris Vaughn got me hooked on it. Um, so Wilma is a good landmark on the moon. And once you see her, you really do, it's really easy to navigate around that. So first of all, yes, Mare Chrysium, which is this little Mare that's out to the side. It's on the, in this case, when we're looking at the moon, you'll, you can use the same compass directions where you have north up here, east, south, and west. Um, so this is on the eastern side of the moon. And when you're looking for it, it's just, it's the only Mare that is, isolated from the rest of them. It's completely on its own. Uh, so give that one a, a little look. The other one that we wanted to show you guys uh, or take on tackle this week is Mari Tran Tranquillitatis because that is where Apollo 11 landed. Yep. Oh, um, Apollo 11. Um, yeah. And so that's a that's a fun one because it's fun to be able to find the spot where Apollo 11 landed. Yeah, and then I can talk a little bit. So if you're using a telescope, so with binoculars, oh, do you want to point out where it is with binoculars? Yes, with binoculars, because we're doing this all right side up and not flipped around. Um, look for the top part of Wilma's hair and then go down one big chunk. So it's the back part of Wilma's hair, her bun, as it were. Um, that is the Sea of Tranquility or Mare Tranquillitatis. Yeah, so I'm gonna try and hold the lunar map up here and point out exactly where um, Apollo 11 landed. Now you won't be able to see the lunar module with your telescope, I actually calculate at once how much it would cost to build a telescope on Earth that could see the lunar module or at least the bottom half of the descent module. And uh, I came up with a number for the cost to build this telescope and it was 60 times the entire world economy. <laughs> um, yeah, because the moon is, uh, you know, <laughs> I wanna use miles, you know, about 360,000 kilometers away on average. So you're not, 
it takes a huge telescope to see something that small versus you know a galaxy which is millions and millions of light years across or sorry tens of thousands of light years across okay so here is the sea of tranquility come on camera focus focus uh, okay. it's gonna be tricky. I think it's right there. So it's it's more obvious when you're looking through a telescope and usually about, I, I look for this during a full moon, it's kind of tough, but you know, during the next couple of days, if you're looking through a telescope as you approach first quarter, there's in, in the sea of tranquility here, there's a, a, a line of craters that forms almost a perfect L or sort of two lines of craters right here. I don't know if you can see that, but um, you'll definitely see it through a telescope. And the bottom of the L, points at the landing site for Apollo 11. And on the moon maps, it's usually marked with this little star right here. Um, and so, so I use the lunar L to be able to find Apollo 11. So I still haven't found it because I haven't tried partly, partly but also because it seems complicated. Um, I know it's not that complicated, but just for now. So if you, if you want, if you have your telescope and you're used to using it and, uh, or you, know, you, you have the ability, go and try and find it. But otherwise, just try to find the sea itself. Um, it's a good starting point. Uh, we're we're at the intro level here, right? So we want to yeah, just that's for if, like if you've got all the power and yeah, yeah. If you're if you're joining us with you know fifty of your targets already seen, talking to you, Rask members, um, <laughs> then then absolutely go and take a look for it. Um, we're, for those of you who are like who are just starting out, we really just give give just taking a look at the full moon at all a try, um, and then see if you can find those those two mares. Um, if you really want to push it, I think I had a, even a, yeah, if you really want to try to find another one, um, Serenitatis, the Sea of Serenity is another good one. Um, I'm going to, once again, share Solarium. I stopped sharing so that John could have his moment in the spotlight. Um, and see, uh, see of, sorry, where is the, Serenitatis is this one down here. Is that right, John? No, it's, I think it's, it's right north of um, Tranquility. Right, okay. So that's, yeah. it's, it's the top it's of Wilma's hair. hair. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So we have Serenitatis and Tranquilitatis. So Serenity and Tranquility, um, if you're looking for those two. And it's kind we'll of cool. The, the lunar seas are named after uh, how the sea makes you feel or like states of the sea. So you've got like the sea of clouds, sea of rains. You know, crises, sea of crises, yeah. Crises, yeah. Interesting, so cool. That's I always cool. thought that's really neat. So there's a backstory to every, everything that's got a name on the moon. There's an interesting backstory to go along with it. Mm -hmm. A lot of craters with uh, with lots of names too, um, and also fun fact for those of you who don't know this one yet, um, mares these seas are only so called they're not actual oceans, but this is yet another instance of astronomers looking at a thing and going that kind of looks like an ocean. Let's call it an ocean, and then they did, even though it has nothing to do with it. Um, this is also how they named several other objects in space, uh, and we'll get to those as well. <laughs> um, so those are the big uh, mares that we're looking for. Um, the other the other object that we're looking for is the Tycho crater. Um, Tycho, so interestingly, with the moon, uh, the best time to look for craters is usually not on the full moon. And the reason for that, I'll actually jump us back a couple days so that we can see it not on the full moon. It yeah, Stellarium's not so great for showing this because it doesn't change the contrast. Not particularly, day day. no. Yeah. But you do you do see um, the thing with you, you really want to be looking along when you're looking for craters, looking along. The shadow, terminator. the terminator, yeah. yeah. So this this line is the line between daytime and nighttime on the moon. So it's essentially when it's moving from east to west across, that's sunrise. And then when it's moving from, sorry, that's a lie. They both do that. Um, when it's going from dark to light, and it's the moon is getting brighter, that's sunrise. And then when the moon is getting, the face is getting smaller, um, on the second half of the lunar cycle, that sunset on the moon. Yeah. But no matter what, at sunrise and sunset, you get really long shadows. And so when you get long shadows, you can see craters and mountains and ridges and all sorts of stuff like that better. Um, so that's why it's the best time to look for those big- Well, so I just said bridges. I'm like, there's bridges on the moon? That'd be cool. <laughs> not yet, maybe someday. Not, not yet, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so Tycho is unique and Stellarium's not showing it here. So Tycho that's is a ray see, crater like that's very yeah. young, only about 200 million years old, which is young in terms of craters. So um, this image isn't showing it right here. I have but, another one. I'm going to show you a different one. Yeah, so she'll bring, bring it up. And, and so rays are the ejecta of after the asteroid hit that made Tycho. It spewed um, uh, dust and rocks out all across the surface of the moon. Um, and the, the color of, that, of the ejecta 
is, or it's actually, it's just more reflective. And so when you're looking at it, it appears white. Mm -hmm. And the rays from crater, or uh, the rays from the Tycho crater stretch all the way up. So you can see the rays um, going, you know, quite a ways along, along the moon. You can sort of trace them. Um, I think one of them goes the whole, like the whole diameter of the moon, which, wow. is, which is really fantastic. That's insane. So that's, yeah, this is, this is, uh, so I actually went out specifically looking for Tycho Crater before we started this program. And I found it very hard to see initially. Like I could see some of the rays, but I couldn't see the crater itself because it was just so darn bright. Like the, the Maris were easier to see because they were a little bit darker. Um, but I found if I waited like a minute while looking at the moon, then you could start to pick out where the actual crater is, which is down here. Um, so give that a try. Take some time and like really look at the moon for a while with binoculars to be able to find this stuff. Um, this is where sketching gets kind of tricky because you like you're kind of bouncing in back. You're looking at the moon and you're going, okay, fine. And then you're sketching it and then you're going back and you're looking and then you're sketching it. And you have to let your eyes readjust each time. So yeah. maybe for this session. And did we, did we talk about right? spend five minutes just how to use binoculars and some features that your binoculars might have to be able to do this? Yeah, we could talk about that. Hold on, what time is it? We only have 20 minutes left. Um, can I get through the rest of the topics before we go Absolutely, into that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, just cool. Remember to go back to that. Sounds good. So, so um, that's it for moon objects this time around. Keep an eye on the full moon. Observe the full moon because the phases count as well. Um, and then we'll and then we've got Mari Chrysium, Mari Tranquillitatis here, which is the back part of Wilma's hair. Mari Ser Serenitatis, if you want to, which is the front part. Of I love that you know the Latin names. I just don't. I can't say them. The only reason I, I know is because I learned it all because through our guide, which is all in Latin. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So if you, we can go with English. Um, I don't know. Sea of crises, sea of crises, sea of tranquility, tranquility, and sea of serenity. Yeah, yeah. Um, so those are the three mares that we're looking for, the three seas, and then the crater is Tycho. Follow those rays as much as you can back to their originating point down at the bottom of the moon. Okay, also thank you to Michael Watson from whom I stole this photo. He is one of our board members, so hopefully he won't mind, but he is a lawyer, so I am a little bit afraid of him. Alrighty, and then the next objects that I'm, we're gonna talk about are the constellations that we're looking for this time around. We have some easy constellations for you that for the most part are visible from anywhere. Um, I'm gonna share once again, Solarium with you guys. This session's uh, a little bit packed because we're covering like the basics of observing and the targets that we're trying this week. Um, so here's our night sky from Toronto. Uh, it's a little bit too, eh, we'll move it back a little bit. Um, so that we're, no matter what, we're gonna be observing right after sunset pretty much when we're showing you all this stuff. So if you're a morning, early morning person, uh, you'll have to get, go on Solarium and find out for yourself what's up. We're just showing you what's happening this evening. And if you hear yeah. screams, that's my kids in the backyard. <laughs> the window's open. John also has another astronomy pet named Pet. John has a dog. Oh, uh, yes. Named yeah, Lyra. So after the, the constellation Lyra, which is in the Summer Triangle, which we'll probably talk about next. We're going to go over, actually, two sessions from now, we're going to go two over the Summer Triangles. Yeah. Um, OK, so first off, we're going to find everyone's favorite constellation, which is the Big Dipper. Um, technically, it's not a constellation, if you want to go all well actually about it. Um, it is a, an asterism, so it's a group of stars that's easy to find in the night sky. Um, kind of like Orion's Belt, uh, same sort of deal, where it's like a chunk of stars, but they're not necessarily like an officially recognized group. Um, and that's one of the easier ones to find because it's pretty large, um, and it's always up in the sky, no matter what time of year. As long uh, as you're north of the... Yeah, you yeah. can't see it if you're too far down south. So this yes. applies to people observing from in you know, the United States and Canada and Europe. And yes, it's always visible for us up here in Canada, at least. Um, and I think even in Florida, you can't see it in the autumn. So you have to be careful. Anyway, um, so right now it's up. It's, it's almost always in the northern sky. Sometimes it looks more directly overhead and other times it's further in the north. Right now it's in the northwest. And what you're looking for is this arc of a handle and then the pot. Lots of people have seen it as different things. Um, a plow, a kite, a gourd, a fisher. Um, we always call it the Big Dipper. You can call it whatever you'd like. Um, if you're looking at it in the sky, if you stretch out your arm and hold your hand in like the hang loose gesture, that will cover about from the very tip of the tail of the Big Dipper all the way down to the star here. It's quite big in the night sky. This is part of the Ursa Major constellation, which is the one that is on our list for today is Ursa Major. Um, Ursa Major actually extends down. So you can see it's got these two legs here, one leg there, 
and another leg here. And then it's got its head out here. Um, yeah. I'm going to put up the line so you can see it properly. Oh, the, it great, the great bear. The great bear. Yeah. So you can even turn on the artwork too for extra fun. Yeah, sure. There's the artwork. Um, so there's this is the tail of the bear, which always seems counterintuitive because bears should not have long tails. Uh, but there's multiple stories to explain it away. Um, and then this is the head of the bear. So if, if we're talking about the tail of the bear or the handle of the Big Dipper, that's the same thing. Um, and then this is the body of the bear. Uh, you know, maybe it's like his other back leg and he's just kicking. <laughs> it could be. It could be. It could be. Um, you never know. That's the thing with constellations is you can kind of make them up. Yeah, you um, have fun with it. Yeah, you can have fun with it. So Ursa Major is the first one. Uh, and then right now, we're gonna also show you, this is this is one where you might be able to just see one star of this constellation if you're in the city, but it's still worth trying to find because it's useful for many reasons. Uh, and that is the little bear. Um, and the little bear, you can find, some of you may know this trick already, um, by looking for the North Star. And you can find the North Star by first finding the Big Dipper, looking for these two stars here at the end of the Big Dipper's pot, they're Mirak and Dubey, but I can't remember which order they're in. Yep, there we go, Mirak and Dubey. And you can draw a line through those to Polaris, which will always be in the same spot in the night sky for now and 20, wait, no, 13,000 years it'll move, but we'll get there later. Um, for now, it's in the same spot. It's always above the North Pole, so it means that it looks like it stays still in the night sky. Um, and then the Little Dipper curves around back towards the Big Dipper. So back towards the tail of the Big Dipper from the star. The rest of the stars are pretty faint. You might be able to see this one and maybe yeah. this one. So it's a good gauge of how dark your skies are, um, the Little Dipper. So from Halifax, we've got quite a bit of light pollution, but we can still see you know, three or four of the stars on, on, a, on a good clear night. Um, but as, as you go away from town, more of the stars, and then I think there's seven total, you can see them all you mm -hmm. know, after you've got pretty decent decently dark skies. So that's, and we're going to talk about how to escape light pollution and what it is and why it's difficult to observe in the city on the next session in more detail. So we will get to that. Um, we're just trying to keep it shorter for this session and cover some more basic stuff because the moon's going to be up anyway, and the moon makes it hard to see too. So we've got those two constellations. I'm also giving you guys a couple constellations that we're going to lose soon. So you got to observe them now because if you want to observe the ones that are technically springtime constellations, now is the time. Um, the first one is an easy one to find the main star of because you use the Big Dipper again. In this case, you're following the arc of the tail and you're arcing down to, hey -oh, Arcturus. Um, and so this is at the base of a constellation called, arguably, Booties. I think it's technically called Booties, um, but Booties is much more fun. To and say. I'm not going to say it at all because I'll just get in trouble. Yeah, it's true. John's, I, I'm going to call John out on this because he calls it booties, which I, I enjoy. Um, I'm pretty sure we have a specific pronunciation guide somewhere in uh, the Observer's Handbook. I'm not going to look it up right now. It's that constellation. It's B-O-O -O with an umlaut, T-E-E-S. -E -E um, there's the spelling. Oh, it's the umlaut's not in there. Okay, fine. I guess it's booties. <laughs> <laughs> um, so in this case, once you find Arcturus, Arcturus sorry, you're looking for a kite shape of stars up moving sort of sort of in the direction of the tail. Um, the kite is very easy to find. I find it a little bit harder to see these extra little bits down here. Not entirely sure what Buodis is. Oh, it's a person. Um, but you can certainly find that kite shape and you might even be able to see this little circle of stars on the other side, which is a crown. Corona Boren, nope, Corona Borealis. So that's the next constellation is Buodis. Uh, and then we actually have to go slightly earlier in the night to see the third constellation. I'm only gonna take us back to, there we go. Yeah, that's probably good enough. This one you have to get out right after sunset to see, even a little bit further back. Uh, there we go. <clears throat> and this one is Leo. So this so one- So it's supposed to be a lion, but I see it's a mouse. I mean, really. Yeah, it's I can see, yeah, it's like a backwards mouse, yeah. Yeah, yeah well, that's his tail and then the, the triangle is his yeah, head. Yeah, I can see that. This is supposed to be a lion, but it could be a mouse. Yeah, yeah. It's nicely with stories. <laughs> Um, so finding, finding uh, Leo right now, so once you've got, um, there's different ways to do this. I have a way which might be kind of convoluted, but I kind of like it. So John, feel free to throw in your way if you'd like to. Um, after you find Arcturus, you can continue down that trajectory to this star here, which is also pretty bright. That one's called Spica. So you can arc to Arcturus and then spike to Spica. <clears throat> 
And then the tail of the lion or the nose of the mouse, Spica and Arcturus make a triangle, like a almost a perfectly equilateral triangle. Yeah. So I think I think even Stellarium, they like, they nicknamed that the spring triangle, except I think yeah. they use Regulus. And uh, so that's that's an asterism that you might hear once in a while. Use Regulus? How do you make a triangle out of Regulus? No, no, with, with Arc Arcturus vet um Arcturus Spica Regulus. Oh, okay, I see. Yeah. All right. This one I used a nebula because it makes a nicer triangle. It does. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, um, I even forget my, my triangles. Isosceles? This is an equilateral triangle. Equilateral. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Um, I had this conversation in front of a grade nine class two days ago, yesterday, where I was like, it makes a, a, a some type of triangle that- Oh, they really need to bring back Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? That was a great mm -hmm. show. It's gonna be a hard no for me, dog. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so we have, so that's the best way I find to find uh, the tail of the, or well, the head, the tail of the lion, the head of the mouse, whatever you'd like. Um, and then just kind of continue on from there and look for this backwards question mark without the lines. Uh, it looks, it's a little bit, there's like a little bit of a triangle here. It's a right angle triangle. Got it this time, guys. Um, so do you know then, why the question mark is nicknamed the sickle, which I, oh, okay. so is the asterism, but I'm not sure what's like, I forget, is that the a nickname for Maine or what does sickle mean? I'm no, sure. Sickle, they, sickle's like, actually sickle was what, um, Quotes was holding. I'm pretty sure that thing. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like harvesting wheat or something. Yeah, like that's also okay. interestingly enough, this spica, this star, that name means wheat. Um, ah. In in something, I'm not entirely sure what, but it does. Um. Anywho, so those are going to be our three constellations, or sorry, four constellations for today. So we have Buotes, the Big Dipper, Leo the Lion, and the Little Dipper as well. Um. The one last thing that I'm going to tell you guys, I don't know what time we're at. Yep, the last object that I'm going to challenge you guys to find this week or these next two weeks is a double star. Double stars are neat. We have a whole program on them if you're interested in finding out more about them. And we're going to talk more about them later in this series as well. But they're just stars that either appear close together or are close together. They're just stars that are nearby each other. Um, and there's a very famous one in the Big Dipper. And it's the second star in the Big Dipper's handle right here. And if you zoom in, you can see this even without binoculars. If uh, in some cases, if you have good eyesight, um, you can see this these two stars here, Mizar and Alcor. So those two there. Um, with binoculars, they look great. They're slightly different colors. I'm not going to tell you what colors they are. John, don't give it away. Um, I want you guys to go out and try and see if you can see what the slight color differences are. And if you have a telescope, you might be be even able to see another star close by as well. Yeah, and then Mizar with with a telescope, Mizar will split again. Mizar will split again. Yeah. Gotta get close enough. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah, there we go. It's got two. So most telescopes should see Mizar split as well. So it's a good test yeah. of your, your focus. Okay, yeah. cool. Okay, so that's it for the list of targets today. Um, it's on the Google Calendar that we have linked to um, on, on our website. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll put the full list of targets up for each se session after we go through them on the website as well so that you guys have a place to go back and reference. Um, and now I haven't looked at the questions in forever because I haven't been on that page. So I'm going to go and keep an eye on. You want to read um, through a couple of them? And I was, I want you to do the crash course in binoculars just in case anyone doesn't know. Yes, you do the crash course on binoculars. I will yeah. take a quick look at what's going on. All right. So I don't know. Step one, take off lens caps. If you're wondering why you can't see anything in the sky, sometimes <laughs> the lens cap's on. Oof. Okay. So the first thing you want to do, I usually use um, no glasses. Okay. So bear with me. And the first thing you want to do is adjust the this uh, axis or this um, hinge right here so that you see a single image or a single, um, you know, and when you watch on TV, you see binoculars, you see the two humps. It's like, no, you want, you want one circular, <laughs> circular image out of both eyes. And so most telescopes have what's called a diopter. So that allows you to change the focus on one eye. So you want to find that. So this, this one spins. And so for me, that's the left eye. So I'm gonna close that eye, put the binoculars up to, and you wanna look at a bright star or something far in the distance. And then you're gonna use this focusing wheel to get that one eye in focus like that. Then you're gonna, once, once you have something in focus with that one eye, you're gonna switch eyes and then use the diopter and turn that until the other eye is in focus. After they're both in focus and as you change targets, you can, you, the focus wheel in the center will focus together. Also, some binoculars have a zoom lever here that adjusts the magnification. 
for our purposes, leave it at the least, you know, for me, it's like between eight and 10. So the least amount of magnification is what you want to use. Cause if you were zoomed all the way in, it's going to be really bouncy and really hard to find a target. Um, so you can just leave it at the lowest magnification. Maybe you want to zoom in on the moon. When you change magnifications, you need to change your focus too. So there's that. So, and the, the other thing you have to be really aware of when you're using binoculars is keeping them stable. So you might want to be sitting down. Sometimes I lay down on the picnic table and have my head, um, you know, firmly against, against the table mm -hmm. and then just rest the binoculars on my eyes and that helps. Um, some people use zero gravity chairs um, and, and fancy stuff like that or a monopole uh, that they rest the binoculars on and, and, and they use that to stabilize it or you can pay 500 bucks and get stabilizing binoculars. That you press a button and a little computer figures it out. Very fancy, uh, reasonable options. <laughs> the price of the Dobsonian telescope that I put in the, the links. Um, and then for a telescope, I actually find telescopes easier to use than binoculars. I don't know if I'm weird. Um, I, I, yeah. The most important thing about um, the telescope is that the finder scope, which you're going to use to find the objects, and the telescope are pointed at the same place at the same time. And then you need to make sure your telescope is in focus. So I usually do these tasks at the same time. So I'll set the telescope up, I'll point it at a bright star. And then I'll adjust the screws on the finder. You usually have two. And if it's a finder scope, there's usually three. Um, just pull this one off, um, three screws. And so you need to make sure that both the telescope and the finder are pointed at exactly the same spot, usually picking a bright star. And then to focus the telescope, you've got a focus wheel here. You wanna make whatever you're looking at as small as possible. So you'll, at first you might see a big donut as your star and you turn this until it's a point. And so most of the stars should just look like points of, of light. And, and that's how you know uh, you're in focus without doing anything fancy like using batten off masks or. You know. <laughs> Don't you name drop, I, that'd be, be nice. I I'm probably you... not pronouncing that right. So I'm is it the Is it the one with the lines? The lines, yeah. Well, this is yeah. this is more for astrophotography. So you put yeah. that over, over the telescope, and then there's a anyway lining up the direction <laughs> spikes and. There's there's lots of fancy stuff that you can do. Um, the question there was a question about what brand of binoculars is good for stargazing. Um, it's not so much about the brand necessarily as it is about the numbers that are associated with it. So, um, I have sort of almost vintage um Celestron binoculars that have. Um, wait, that's not the right side. There it is. Eight by 56 written on them. Um, so that means that they are eight times magnified. And then the width of the thing that I only have one lens cap for, um, the width of the, this, I guess it's the primary objective lens, like the big front lens yeah. is 56 millimeters. So those two numbers mean how close you're going to get and how much light you're going to get. So the, the larger this number, this 56, if it's larger than that, it means that they're going to be big, big, big honk and tell or binoculars. Yep. Um, and the lower the lower the magnification, the lower that number, the easier they are to point. Find stuff. Find stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, so bear in mind. So a couple a couple notes on that. I would never go bigger than this for me personally because I know that if I went bigger than this, I might as well just buy a telescope. Like it's it's too heavy at that point to hold it up. Um, so and for what we're doing, most of the stuff that we're looking for doesn't need a lot of light, so you don't need these giant big things here. Um, I would go for because I've had experience with binoculars, I would go for a greater magnification because you can see more on the moon with them then. Um, that's me personally. If you haven't had experience with them yet, maybe you want a, like a, a smaller magnification so you can find it easier to point stuff. No matter what, practice in the daytime before you go out at night. Yeah, so people important. are wondering about these ones. These are a Bushnell Legacy. So they sell a version of these at Canadian Tire. Um, I think they're under the Canadian tire version, which is a little cheaper. Or, or, I think it's below hundred bucks. And that gives you the zoom, zoom ability, if you like zooming in on the moon and stuff, but it also gives you a low enough. I think they start at 10 X that you're not bouncing around all over the place too much. Um, this exact model is a high quality one. So these are about 250 American, 250 US. Uh, and that's just I don't know what you actually get for the money. They're, they're pretty sturdy and they're not out of collimation. Um, so collimation means that if, with a good pair of binoculars, one lens isn't gonna be pointed in the opposite direction. So I had a pair of cheap binoculars once and you couldn't see anything with them because 
binoculars are like two pairs of telescopes or you know a pair of telescopes and they were just pointed in different directions so you definitely don't want that um but you know canadian most bushnell uh binoculars at canadian tire work yes it's you don't you don't need super super fancy ones and honestly if you've just got a pair lying around try using those yeah definitely um, so I'm gonna answer a couple of bigger questions that we have from folks about the Explore the Universe guide, which I have lost and amid all of the things that I have here. There it is. Um, so a couple questions about this. Uh, if you are a member and you you are have been a member for a while, we have these available. So just email and let us know and we'll send them out. Um, if you are a new member, you can, you'll get these with your membership. So you we have been sending these out with membership since November. So you should get it with your new membership pack. And for those of you who aren't members, you will have to buy this. It's not free, you do have to, to, to buy it, but it is included in membership. So if you wanted to get a membership, you can get this book, this book, and um, Sky News Magazine, which is also a useful resource, um, along with a couple other things, uh, and access to the centers um, through that membership. And on that note, I will also mention that, so John is a member of Halifax Center. Um, and one, many centers, although I'm not sure if they're running right now, many of them aren't, but as we get out of COVID, uh, many centers have telescope loan programs, which means that you can borrow telescopes instead of buying them. Um, and you can take them for a couple of weeks, give them a try. It also is useful if you're not sure what kind of telescope you want to buy and you want to practice, um, you can borrow telescopes instead. So there's some really great value to the RAS membership, especially when you're brand new. Um, so consider that as an option as well. For those of you asking where you can get the RAS membership, that is on our website. Um, I'll send you the specific link to becoming a member. Wow, it's way harder. There we go. Um, so that I will add into the Q&A and I will also add it into the chat and I will do my best to add it into the YouTube uh, description as well. There you go. Okay. Um, if anybody asks questions in the chat, I missed them. So you may want to ask them again in the Q&A. <laughs> I'm answering a few of them as we go here. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so another, another, there have been quite a few questions about Stellarium. I will also add that um, Stellarium ships there. Stellarium, you can get um, a big long tutorial on it. It's an hour and nine minutes long from another one of our volunteers at the link that I just sent out in the, in the chat. Um, this is how to use, how to use Stellarium. Um, so it tells you all sorts of hints and tips and tricks for beginners using Stellarium from another one of our volunteers, Chris Vaughn, who, with whom um, we run another session uh, on Tuesdays called Insider's Guide to the Galaxy. Um, on that note, Insider's Guide to the Galaxy, for those of you who have joined us over there, is starting up again next week. So if you want to join us, that's Tuesday. We're going to switch to every other Tuesday over the summer so that we can get out and observe a little bit here and there. Um, it's not selfish. It's for work. Um, and uh, so that's going to be starting next Tuesday, and we're going to be alternating it with this program. So we'll have one of each of these programs a week. We'll switch from ETU, Explore the Universe, to Insider's Guide, to Explore the Universe, to Insider's Guide. You can join us for both if you'd like, um, or you can just join us for one or the other. OK. <laughs> yeah, a, lot, a lot of technical questions on here. I'm not able to see Jupiter. Sounds like a focusing issue. So um, I have best, a best spot in Toronto. Question. Uh, the best spot in the GTA. I really like uh, Riverdale Park because you get to see West really nicely if there's stuff to see West. Um, but tell you what, for these conversations, yes, also thank you to Bruce who pointed out that Astronomy by the Bay also has a discussion on choosing binoculars. They also have a discussion on choosing telescopes. Um, so Astro by the Bay is another excellent resource for stuff. Yeah, um, they do a Sunday night show as well. They do a Sunday night it's show. Really which good. Is awesome. Yeah. Um, so one of the things, and let us know what you think about this, one of the things that we wanted to do to foster discussion and community and build something that we can all um, communicate with was host a Discord channel. I know that not everyone's familiar with Discord. Uh, we've been trying it out at the national office and we, qu we quite like it so far. Just a place where folks can ask these questions and hear from other members of the community. <laughs> Violent yes to, to Discord, um, where you can talk to each other and you can um, ask these questions and answer them and get experience from other astronomers uh, who might have experience over uh, or more experience than you. Um, so that's an option. Let us know if that's something you think would be useful. Um, we're gonna likely do it anyway. So if you wanna give it a try, come and join us. Um, and it's kind of like Slack. Yeah, it's kind of like Slack, but it's like a slightly more, it's used more for um, chats while video gaming. 
Um, so it's used more by younger people and in a less professional environment, but it's, it serves our need. Um, and there's, a, there's an, a computer app. You can use it on the desktop. You can use it on your phone. Um, you can take it with you while you're observing if you want and try asking questions there if we get enough people there who can answer questions uh, live. So we'll give that a try um, and see how it goes. We do want to have somewhere where you guys can share all this information. Um, normally it would be a club, like an actual physical RASP location, but we can't do that right now. So we want to provide something virtual that fills that void. Um, and that's really what this program is all about too. It's, it's, it's trying to provide a service in a time where we can't necessarily go out and talk to you guys. So make sure you keep talking with us. Um, if you have any questions, uh, post them on social media or send them into me. My email is jenna.hines at rasp.ca uh, right there. I post it everywhere. Um, and I can so put in my, my handle. Yes, yes, John's handle is learn to stargaze. Um, all of the links are posted on at one spot. So I've tried emailing out links before and it just never works. All the links are gonna be at rasp.ca slash etu online. There's a list there already of the Explore the Universe materials that you need, the logbook pages, um, which books are helpful. I need to add John's to that. Um, we've got how to choose binoculars, how to sketch, how to, you know, tips for beginners, Stellarium, um, and then other apps that we're going to be using later as well. And we'll introduce to you in a few, in a few sessions. So that's the main hub for everything. Once we get the Discord up and running, it's going to be on there. Um, we've got a Google Calendar that you can download. It's on there. So it's all on that website. Um, brass.ca slash etu online. Everybody, I finally made a URL that doesn't suck. <laughs> All of my URLs have been terrible. <laughs> um, so give that a go. I'm going to see if we have any last minute questions. Um, there are a total from Kitsa, there are a total of 10 sessions. So we're going for 20 weeks. Um, this is the first and the last one will be October 20 something, I think 29th or so. Um, Alrighty, and John, can you once again remember what uh, what the moon map was that you have? Oh, the sky and telescope version. And remember, if you've got a refracting telescope, get the mirror reversed version. Or if you've got a Schmidt-Hasselbrain style one, you'll need the reversed map as well. But the Dobsonians and binoculars all use the regular map. So Dobbs, Dobbs and binoculars are plain old what you would normally see yeah, in real and life. Dobsonians do like. Newtonians as well. Use the regular. Yeah, and then, regular then refractors are upside down. Refractors are, are mirror reverse. Yeah, you mirror use reverse. the same map for upside down, you just turn it around. Right. Oh, die. <laughs> so, I'm on it, John. <laughs> yeah. Um, there we go. Okay, so yeah. I think that's everything. Our next session is going to be at on Jul July 9th um, at the same time. We're going to go over the next subjects that we're looking for. After that session, we're going to be getting into deep sky objects, which are very exciting, um, but add a little bit of extra challenge. So get out and practice this week. Let us know. We'll, if you can, join the Discord. That link will be up on our website as soon as we can. Um, let us know how it's going. If you need any support, email me or talk to us on social media. Um, and there will be a link for the server, um, the Discord server, on our website in, fingers crossed, a few minutes if I can figure it out. Um, this session is up on YouTube right now, so you can go back and rewatch it if you're looking for um, individual targets. And I think that's it. I think is that's it. it. I, I that think it? we've answered most of the questions. And uh, yeah, let us know what you thought of the session. And uh, we're really excited. We'll take your feedback and incorporate it into future uh, episodes. Yes, and we, we are doing this brand new for the first time. So if there's anything you'd like us to change or add, let us know. Um, the next sessions will be a little bit less rushed. We're excited to see what you guys do with everything. Uh, if you can take pictures, take pictures. If you can't, don't worry about it. We're looking forward to hearing your experiences. Um, and we will see you on July 9th. Thanks, John, for coming and helping me out with all this stuff. <laughs> Thanks, Bye, John. guys. Bye, everyone.